Welcome to today's webinar. I am your host, Matt Cedarberg, product manager at Autodesk and former CEO of T-Splines before Autodesk acquired it. Our webinar today is called Using T-Splines for Model Making and Jewelry, and I'm really pleased to welcome as my special guest today my good friend, the German luxury jewelry designer Saskia Dattner. Saskia, welcome. Hi, Matt. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for being here today. I'll introduce you to Saskia more in a few minutes, but first, let's talk about our agenda today. We've prepared three segments for the webinar. First, I'll introduce you more to Saskia and some of her outstanding T-Spline's work. Second, Saskia will do a live demo of the three main method that she uses for modeling in T-Splines with some relatively simple examples. And I know that these tips and tricks are what a number of you have tuned in for. Third, we'll do something we've never done on one of our webinars before, introduce you to one of our customers' customers. We'll have one of Saskia's current clients on the line to talk about how Saskia used her T-Spline skills to help him realize his dream creating jewelry inspired by famous rock and roll stars. He'll also talk to you about how T-Splines, along with other cutting-edge jewelry technology, helped him collaborate with others halfway across the globe in the design and realization of these rings. So by the end of the hour, you'll have had a chance to gain insight into someone who relies on T-Splines to create the type of high-quality jewelry that her customers demand, see some of her valuable tips, and then see a practical example of how she's using it today in a very interesting and challenging project. As always, we'll reserve some time for questions and answers at the end of the webinar. You're all muted and will remain so, but we encourage you to type in questions throughout the webinar and we'll type back answers. And yes, this is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube after the webinar. So with that, let me introduce you formally to Saskia Dattner. She's a German luxury jewelry designer that has been creating stunning designs with T-splines over the past four years for international clients. Saskia's talent is only matched by her kindness. She's one of the most active members on the T-splines user forum, openly sharing her T-splines expertise with the community, and she's agreed to do so again today. So Saskia, as we get started, tell me more about your background as a jewelry designer. Yes, I, I always wanted to become a jewelry designer or to study jewelry design, but also wanted to know more about the making of the jewelry, the technical part and the production process. So I became goldsmith first and then made my studies. Interesting. In, uh, yeah. And, and why, so, so you were a goldsmith and then at some point you transitioned into using CAD, computer design, to assist you with jewelry. Why did you do that? That came much later. When I started, there was just uh, the workbench, and, and uh, CAD came later. It was a great help for me. But uh, the basic of goldsmithing helps me also with the CAD. Interesting. Enormously. Okay. And so you, w when did you start using CAD then? When was that? I think it started 2002 with the uh, Rhino. Okay. And later on. T-splines. Yeah, and, and why did you start using T-splines? So you, so you started using Rhino, and then at that point, were you doing all of your work in CAD, or were you doing some in hand and some on the computer? Uh, in the beginning, it was mixed up a little bit, but um, from, from CAD to, to workbench. But now with T-splines, I do everything on the computer, really, from the, the smallest stone I'm setting, I make everything on a computer. Wow. And, and why is it that you started using T-splines? Just by hazard. <laughs> I just dropped on this computer program and it blowed me away because here you can really work like, like on a piece of plastic and, and move the form around and, and squeeze it and shake it. It's, it's really fun to work with it. Yeah. Yeah, you mentioned to me that you... You, with T-spines, it feels to you like, you're, like you really are working in wax and plaster. Yes. So, Saskia, you have a distinctive style. I, I've seen a lot of the examples of jewelry that you've shared on our forum, and we'll be sharing some more here in a minute. And you've, you've said here that you want your jewelry to be both functional and wearable, but with a beauty that stands on its own, so that even when the jewelry is not worn, it's beautiful. How did you arrive at that 
philosophy and style? And, and while you answer, I'll be sharing a few more examples of your work. My intention was creating jewelry bearable and comfortable. Even by putting it somewhere down, you still can consider it as an object that stands on its own. Jewelry doesn't make it um, this procedure easy because you have to follow a lot of rules such as the material and the weight and the size and all this stuff. But anyway, that's my intention. I want to make a piece that's, that you, if you wear it, you don't want to put it away. But if you put it away, you like to look at it and it looks from all sides uh, homogen and, and one piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is some beautiful stuff you've done. So, so some of your jewelry, as, as I look at these examples, is obviously a great for, for teaspoons like those fish that we saw in this frog, but others are, are much more subtly organic like this ring setting. So why would you use teaspoons for something like this? Yes, that's in the small detail because here, especially where you have the stone setting, you can, uh, you can manipulate the, the prong, let's say, the prong so small and so easily with these blinds. And if you do this in another program, you have to start again and to put a new prong and maybe you don't like it. And here you can fix it, you can model it around the stone. Mm. Like so you want to have it. Interesting. So the, your ability to still keep the, the model malleable and, and movable even to the small details. Yeah. It's important to you. So here's the uh, here's these ring skulls that you've recently been working on. We'll, we'll talk more about these in detail towards the end of the webinar and also talk with your client, Russ. But again, I think these are really very typical of the type of models that you create of emphasizing simplicity but really having enough complexity to represent the shape. These are these are really beautiful. Thanks. I like those. So I have a number of questions yeah. about how you model these Hosky, but so let's go ahead and transition into the next part of the webinar and have you talk about how you actually work. So you've said that you start your work with a with a scribble or a sketch. Why is that and then what comes next for you? Okay, the scribble and the sketch is mostly for, for, for the detail and the shape and the proportions. So it's just a reminder in my head and I put the, the, this small sketch in, in the background. And then I think about how to approach with these blinds. Okay. It depends on what I'm doing. <laughs> uh -huh. and, and as far as that approach, you, it sounds like you, you told me that in Germany there's a phrase that describes your approach to modeling to modeling that there's more than one way to skin a cat. We we actually have that same phrase in English, but but what do you mean by that? It's it's like like the classical goldsmith. Everyone has his taste or his way to to solve a problem or to to realize a, a jewelry piece. So one is making out of the whole metal of a piece of metal or a wire or whatever, and the other one is cutting it out of the box. Mm -hmm. So everyone has his taste to, to start something to do. And these plants you can do either this way or either the other way. <laughs> Interesting. So it just kind of depends on your model or maybe even your mood at the time of how you'd want to approach, approach that modeling process. Yeah. You've, you've t identified that, that in general, though, there's three ways that you start to model. For either from primitives or from what you call extruding curves, or by using the T-spines pipe command. Um, yep. So, so now if it's all right with you, Pasaski, let's go ahead and make you the presenter and dig into each of these methods of modeling that you have. And so you're, I guess you're you're prepared to walk through and show us even some of the details of what it means to you to start from each of these methods and, and some motivations as far as why you do that. Okay. So let me go ahead and make no, you. No, I'm the present. Yeah, okay. let, me be, let me make you the presenter now. Okay, you can go ahead and show your screen when you're ready. Okay. Good. Okay. I'm ready. Let's see. And just before we jump in, Saski, there is a question that came in. Are those images that we were showing? Are those renderings or photographs of your Hello? models? Mm -hmm. Can the you, pictures, these are yeah. renderings. These yeah. are renderings. Yep. I think we'll have some images of those rings at the end so we can compare yeah. the, the quality of the actual model versus the render. Mm. But yeah, let's go ahead and jump in. So, so talk us through okay. this, this way of modeling. 
Okay, classically you start as a goldsmith. It's mostly you have rings to do, and therefore I I um, I, I use this classic uh, um, primitives. Okay, pick this off, and I start from a new. I usually start with a cylinder. And mostly you have a diameter from, let's say, 18. These are average measurements you have for, for jewelry. It's not from big importance, but you know that. So I type in 2. Put this in center. Now I like to have a symmetry in this. cover this way and I want another one on the other direction. So I have now this on both sides and now I give him this ring a thickness let's say about two now I have a ring and mostly you have on the top part you have something special like for ring setting or a pearl or whatever or something important that comes up on the on the top. Now I make up my hat. Go on faces. And I choose these four faces. And just extrude them a little bit. Put them higher. I want to have it flat on the top, so I use this scaling. And I have something like that. So Saskia, just as you're working, one thing I, I had asked you yeah, to do yeah. was just to focus on the general yeah. workflow instead of necessarily all of the picks and clicks. But if any of you have any questions as far as what exact command Saskia is using, feel free to type those in and then I or, or the other uh, guys on the line can, can answer those questions. Okay. So now I, I manipulate the shape. Okay, this now is... And I have always four windows open because if I, if I squeeze here, I look at the same moment in the front or in the top view. That's my way of working. I'm, I'm used to it. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. I want to make it bigger here to give it this little shape. Now I should become a little bit round, but we will fix this later on. Let's say like this, okay? So I click this away now because I did some of these examples already before. Okay, I put in this. So as you transition from that that model that you made from scratch in this one, Saskia, and really what all you've done is just pull control points. But my impression is that's yes. is that where a lot of where your your time really goes when you're modeling is is sitting there and 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 playing with the form. Yes, yes, because I have the form in my head. Yep, and. With these lines, I can I can manipulate these edges or words the way I like, and if I don't like, I, I do undo, and and start from again till I like this final shape. So so often you really yeah. are designing as you're modeling, then, aren't you? Yeah, yes, that's exactly what I'm doing. But now I want to put something different on the top that becomes at the end one piece, as you saw on the first screen. I just delete these four faces again. I grab the line, the rim of the line, and as you see I had here a, a curve, a round curve, and I want to pull these edges now, this edge rim to the curve that I have exactly, that it becomes exactly the same diameter that I have here. So I use this pull control command 
choose my curve and it becomes exactly the same diameter here on top. Now I can take away this edge rim. I don't know why I have it but I think it's needful. <laughs> anyway, now I have this shape and I can go on to put something on the top that I model in in a second part. Yeah, just as you're as you're usually, getting usually I use here a quad ball. Yeah, and as as you're getting that Saskia, one mm -hmm. one thing that you did here was was matching really the the edge of the T-spine to that curve. And going back to your quote about how there's more yeah. than one way to, to skin a cat, a, a command that, that I often use in others as well as the match command, which, which lets you match within any tolerance of a curve. But what you're saying is there's another command that you use, the pull control points command, which gets a similar behavior to you and, and maybe meets your tolerance requirements of, of getting the edge of the T-spine to that curve. Yes, I think it's it's matching perfectly. Yeah, that's this, good. This this line, and anyway, you with jewelry later on you have really to measure in millimeters and tens of millimeters. But for the basic shape, you need first of all to have the the design you like, and um, yeah. But now I want to put these two parts together. Okay. Anyway, you can you can change this design in whatever you like. Here I have the quad ball. If I put these two together, it will be around bubbled stuff. Let's mm -hmm. do this. And this is another, as, as you're walking through, I think you're going to maybe bridge these oh, together. Wait, wait. But I think this is another interesting approach that you have is some people, when they model with T-spines, they take the approach that they have to model everything from one unified object. But... One interesting thing that you do is you you model separate parts to define them, and then later yeah. on you bridge them together, which in a way gives you a bit more control over over your shape. Yes, I I tried. That's just what I tried. I I, I thought you can put pieces together and not pull out. You can even pull this out of the of the basic ring shank, but I figured this out, and I think it's a nice way to to solve this problem. It looks like this. I yep. make undo, undo, and I choose another other thing because I want it to have a round to a square. And this is going the same way. Rich. Anyway, you lose the symmetry in this using this command. Yeah, and again, I, I really like this this approach, Sa oh, Saskia. Yeah, this is this is subtle, but you what you're doing is you're kind of combining T spines modeling methods with how you might model in Rhino. Because in Rhino, you'd you'd make separate surfaces and then blend them together. And what yeah. you're doing is is making separate T spine surfaces and then blending those yeah. together, yeah. which I think is really powerful. Um, and let's say if I if I don't like it like this at the moment, I still can change everything I like. any direction I want. Okay. <laughs> but I think I did this, I did this to put these two parts together that I keep the ring shank in the shape it should be. Therefore mm -hmm. I put these two parts this way together. And that it has this homogen flu. Yep. Yeah, that's because that's one thing you do get when you when you merge it all together, you do get yeah. a very smooth flow throughout. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Good. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and go to your your next uh, workflow. Let's and I that. guess before before you switch, someone commented on on the layers you have set up, Saskia. Are you using? Yeah. Do you use your layers for design variations, or, or what do you when you're actually working? What do you use your layers for? Sometimes I I make a copy. I make a copy, put it in a layer, and then I work over it. I I put it in uh, in uh, in hiding, mm -hmm. so I only can change the new version, and I make it in. Uh, uh, in ghost view, so I see the below, and I can, like you see here now, for example, a little bit. Oh yeah. I said I want to change this a little bit, and 
Sometimes it's a problem to work with too much layers. Anyway, it's still there if you have a layer and you can delete it later on. But I guess one, one benefit of, of, doing, of working that way is when you get to a point where you like the model and you're thinking you may branch the design or explore another variation, you, you're saving a copy you can always come back to. Yeah. Anyway, you should save, you should save your file yep. a lot of times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because smart. sometimes it can crash us and that's very, very sad. Yep. But let's say I, 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 sometimes I, it, it comes out this shape, okay? And I wanted that shape, but I don't want to throw it away because I said maybe it's nice again, and so I keep it in a different layer, and I can show several similar variations to a client, and then he can choose whatever he likes. Yeah, yep. Did you want to show making sure that this meets your exact ring size, or, or are you prepared to show oh, that, or should we okay. move on to the next one? Ah, you wanted to that I show this. Okay. That's a trick I do because sometimes if you squeeze, it will change the inner uh, ring. Okay? Yeah. Here, here I think it fits very well, but I I used to take this um, cylinder. It's a rhino cylinder. Okay, so that's okay, you the see ring size. Here, you see now here, it's not matching totally perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I use again the pull control command. I grab all these all these inner edge rims. Okay. Pull control to to this and then it relaxes on. You see here down on the front? I make back and forward. Oh yeah, there so you, you go. See that it that it becomes round. So even if okay? in the process of your modeling you you yeah. inadvertently move a control yeah. point, this is how you get back to make sure you have the, the right ring size. Yes. Yeah. Good. No, that's helpful. Cool. Well, let's move on to the second the second demo then. And so this first demo, there's a question Wendy just asked. This this is the Saskia's method of starting by primitives. So let's go to the next method, which you call extruding curves. Okay. <laughs> that's my fish. <laughs> I did this uh, similar one to uh, to a client, but I can't show his example. So I, sh I I made a new one because I loved now to to figure out how it how it works here with the fish. So I thought maybe nice and interesting for you to to follow this too. I close this. Here I put my little sketch inside, and I just draw a, a line, and I extrude this line. So it's just a it's just a curve. Is that what that is? It's it's just a curve. Yep. With few points. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then I need to make this centered, and I extrude once again. And that's just and holding down the Alt key and dragging the manipulator. If you're not familiar with how to extrude. Sorry. I mean, if, if someone's not familiar with how to extrude, all you're doing is just holding down the Alt key while you drag the manipulator. I, I don't <laughs> do it like that. So, I just, because I all, I'm very visual, I have all my commands here open because I need to see them. I don't like to type them in. No. Oh, okay. So, you're actually clicking how the extrude I, I command. <laughs> yep. Okay. okay. So, here I have now, I go to words. Ah, sorry. <laughs> it's like it just undid it or something, huh? I don't know, maybe I did something wrong. Yeah, it looks like it just did an undo, but... Yeah. I wonder if idea. maybe the uh, display mode is set so it doesn't show. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. I need to do it once again. There you go. I need to extrude this one more time. This I want to have really centered line, more or less. OK. 
है So I now just pull and push all these words that they become similar to my to my designing sketch. So I get this basic shape. Mm -hmm. and, and with this sketch, then is it is it important for you to exactly hit your sketch, or is it do no. you mainly sketch just for proportions? It's just for proportion, and and later on, I, it's just for proportion, and and later on, I give him the the shape I I admire I like to have mm -hmm. yeah just where it, sh it should be the eye or the fin or yeah if I do something for myself if that's a design for for a customer who wants exactly the same then I need to be more exact yeah but if yeah. I do something for me I'm more free to 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 make the shape no that makes sense it. yeah and we'll, I think yeah. we'll show the example with the skull rings okay. in a bit the the input that you needed to match yeah. for that let's say I did all this stuff now, uh, the shape, but then I extrude these parts again, let they come here, okay? I did this before, so I put this away, you can see the fish worked out because it takes a little time. Yeah. Now it's flat paper, flat, thin. So that's just one on dimensional right there, or two dimensional, yeah. isn't it? So it hits more or less my sketch and I'm happy with it. And now I just grab all the faces again and I extrude them. Let's say by one. And then I just extrude the inner part of the fish. Wait, I do it again. Uh, sorry. So as you're extruding I that, extrude the, the body. Yeah, mm -hmm. as you're extruding that, there's a question that's come in. Can we draw the surface in NURBS and then turn it into T splines? And uh, <laughs> depends. <laughs> depends. Yep. So you can certainly draw NURBS patches. Something like this that's not rectangular would be a bit more difficult to describe or probably impossible to describe as a single nerves patch because you can't, if you trim the nerves, then the, then that won't convert over to T-splines. You know, the nerves should be one complete surface yep. and not pulled or trimmed or something. It, it will not work. Therefore, you have T-splines. You can model it in T-splines. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. And you can easily go from a T-splines to a nerve. If you have it then. Yeah. So... So here you I have the, the fish. Uh, yeah. so here Sorry, you have I manipulated it in, a little bit here. Yeah. So. Hmm. And you're showing it here in box mode. Is that do you usually work in box mode or how often do you switch back to smooth mode to to see how the actual model's gonna look? I usually work most time in, in smooth mode. Uh -huh. I don't know why, because I wanted to show this paper thin. I don't know oh, why yeah. I, I put it here in this box mode. But usually I work in, in uh, smooth mode. Yeah, it makes sense. And You'll see. Now I give him a body. Okay, I make it two parts. The symmetry. And now, because usually I really work in, in smooth mode, because sometimes you get a shock if uh, it w won't become smooth mm -hmm. when you have a, when you made a, something, when you have a fault inside. Yep. So, but here we are lucky. <laughs> It's smooth, totally smooth, one yeah. clear shape. Okay, so the fish needs eyes. I have here my reference point where it should be the eye. So. 
because we call this extruding. I extrude this face. inside to have more or less the position of the the eye hole of the fish yeah okay I show you bigger so and then I want to give him the eyes. Let's say I made a, a quad ball in the position at where I want to have the eyes, but now I want to have one whole body, eyes and body of the fish should be one piece together. And this I do with the bridge command. I choose this face. And this face. Open it again. Just bridge it. You lose the symmetry by this way. Anyway, you can get it back. <laughs> and now you have one totally complete surface. Uh, Tea splines. Or you oh. still can manipulate everything. So Saskia, you, you told me a couple of years ago that you you had been working on a project at the time that you estimated was four times faster for you to do in T-splines than if you just used NURBS. I, I'm just curious, it, since, I mean, a few years have passed since then, is that, mm -hmm. are you still seeing a similar efficiency with T-splines or, or how is your experience now? I'm I'm still seeing it that way. Maybe I'm because you can't say I need for this fish one hour or ten hours or half an hour. It's it's you can't give a, a time limit to a, to a design if you want to create something. You you yeah. It's but anyway, if I show this now to a customer and he said, okay, I like the fish, but he, she should be much skinnier or the eyes should be smaller or everything. If I did this in a let's say in Rhino and I cut every part together, I put, pulled everything together, I really can start from the beginning because you can't, you can't, you can't, um, uh, you can scale it, but anyway, that's it. Or you can put something on, and this I don't wa want, I don't want to make patchwork on, on my models because it looks always uh, a little bit, not as it should be. <laughs> I, I like to keep it simple and and one direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's a question that came in just asking if you've done jewelry by hand, and we talked at the start of the webinar that you, you did do that for quite a few years. How does this compare yeah. to, to your experience working at the bench, I mean, on a model like this? For sure. I, I can say in the beginning, I said it can't be the same like you do it by hand. But I'm really... It's it's like you do it by hand. You get you get used to it, and you 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 like your commands, and 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 at the end you say it's much easier. You can do things you can never do with you you can never do by hand. And that's a fortune. It's really a big fortune. Mm -hmm. Let's say now he has a mouse. But this mouse is squared now. It don't looks nice, no. Yeah. So I made it round the same way. I don't want to show it again, but here you see wait. You see a line, a curve that I put in this position. Okay. And I just did the same way. I, I put the edge rim and I pulled control points on this curve and then it became oh, a neat shape. Okay. So so I'm really so the next bit of this workflow I think is really powerful because you, you're going to show how you combine T-splines using some Rhino commands to get variations. And if maybe we could start getting into that. But as, as you do that, if, if you're able to talk while you work, there's a really interesting question that came in from Wendy about asking if you can explain how your bench experience has influenced the way that you model or your modeling methods in T-splines. 
<laughs> I know what's possible and what's not possible. That's that's really if you are on uh, I won't say only designer. If you're a design, designer and you want to create something you all, and you don't know how really to to do it on your own and you have to ask a goldsmith of your ideas. It's it's very difficult because you have it, the design in your head and the other one should realize it. And that's what I told in the beginning, that was really my first step to become first goldsmith and then designer because I, it's not that I'm not a team player, but I, I think design is two-dimensional, but jewelry or whatever, if you make a vase or, or a glasses, it's three-dimensional. If you give a shape to something and you, you can, can't draw it from, from all, all sides, you know, you have to model it and yeah. So, I think to yeah. know to know how to do it is not it's not wrong. That's not that I'm a perfect goldsmith. I have, for this I have no patience. I have more patience for this CID. <laughs> but I know how to do it and, and what's possible and what's not possible. Yeah, no, that's really powerful. Yeah, yeah. yeah Brian just chimed in to say that he agrees yeah. that learning how to make it before you design really is yeah. really gives you a lot of yeah. a lot of power. And even then if you if you make only a two dimensional design and you give it to, to a goldsmith to realize it for you. If you have a little idea how to, to work on the bench, you can come closer to him to explain your idea, what you had in mind from your, from your sketch. Yep. Well, good. Well, Saskia, okay. if, if you no, wouldn't I, mind showing, I, I yeah, this is really, <laughs> hey, no, that's <laughs> fine. <laughs> okay. Okay. This, I, I have now decided the fish is ready, but I want that he's swimming in the water, so he has a movement, okay? You can do this also with these splines, with pulling and pushing, but I, I figured out that maybe this way would look nice or would go easily. So I, I choose, let's say, I want to give him this wavy uh, movement, okay? Like it's just a curve I draw. And I go to the rhino, to the flow along curve command. I select my object. I select the base curve, I select the target curve, and that's it. Wait. And the fun is it's still a T splines. <laughs> That was the basic shape. I kept a copy of it. Yeah, those are those are okay. powerful tools to make more global deformations to the T spline. So then in those, those that command in case someone didn't catch it, it's the Rhino flow along curve command. Yeah. It's rhino flow along curve command. Yep. Yeah. And you can so yeah, again still I continue to iterate that. So now I make a copy. <laughs> of this that I can show you again later on. Copy in place, put it in height. And I want to show you another one. It's the this miracle stuff here, the cage edit. I choose a bounding box. Just leave it as it is. And now I can twist and squeeze this fish in any direction I want. And I can use my my translator here, my manipulator. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're showing, yeah, so this is another one of Rhino's commands called the cage edit. And these, these commands, cage edit and flow along curve, are really powerful. And we would have just put them in the T-spines tool set, but Rhino already had them. So uh, the downside is that doesn't make them quite as discoverable, but the good thing is they they're the same commands you'd use for any other Rhino command. So that's there's there's a lot of Rhino commands like that that work on T spines. And if you have questions as far as which ones you can use, if you go to tspines.com and look at the user manual, you can just search for user manual there. There's a list of most of the Rhino commands, and it indicates if you can use those on T spines or not. So you can you can pull this in any direction you 
you like. Take it off. So, now we have three different fishes. Let's show this. From one, from one design, from one model. And you can make uh, a whole ocean full of fishes <laughs> if you want. That goes really very fast. But you need to have a little bit patience to decide in which direction you will squeeze it or not. So that's it. Yeah, and as far as communicating with clients, Salski, this is really powerful if instead of giving them one option, you can give them a number of options to, to choose and give direction yeah. on. Yes, I try a lot. I try a lot. If, it, if I fail, I, I try something else. Because you have really so many commands, either in T-splines or in Rhino, you never use. Yep. So from time to time, I, I try some, some of them, and I put them into my bi bibliotheque, you say like that? <laughs> oh, library? In my portfolio. Yep. <laughs> I keep them. When I like them, I keep them. So what you see, it's still a T-splines, and you can manipulate whatever you like. Yeah, good. Well, let's move into the last one so that we, we have enough time for, for the rest of the webinar sure. and talk about how you use the pipe command. Okay. Pipe command is very, very great. I like it very much because sometimes for, for, um, for engravings or some things like that to make, to make pieces special, I put this pipe command. I use it in other ways as well, but especially the last time I use it for engravings in, in rings or giving names. Or so just put in the bitmap of what you like to, to write or of what you like to draw. Maybe you want to draw something, not even a writing. And you just draw a line. You see now the red line. Just a line around. And then you have the history command. In this case, I like to use it because you can now pull and push the, the, the main curve in the direction you like to have it. Yep. So no, another or, example of using T-splines commands along with Rhino features as well. Yep. So put it into smooth. Chuck. And now we have the pipe command. You see here sometimes it's not the direction it should be or maybe you want to, I put now the the ghosted view so I can find my my baseline. Activate the points so you can drag the the point in the direction you like to have it, and the T-splines follows the line. That's great. Okay, you can do this as long as you want, and when you say you're finished, then you just get off this, this points. And here I wait. Here I already manipulated the edges a little bit to the to the shape I liked. So it's always the same. You push and pull, and the way you like to have it, more thick, more thin. Good. And you you see, I I deleted a lot of edges which are not needful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is a command I've seen you use in, I mean, this is a good simple example, but you've used this in, in much more complex instances as well. Yeah. Well, Saskia, let's go ahead and, and, and move on to the last bit of the webinar so that we make sure we have a little bit of time for questions, if that's all right. Okay. And thank you very much for that demo. That went, that went really well. You're I welcome. really appreciate it. So let me go ahead and, and make myself the presenter again. So, Saskia, you had been kind enough to type up quite a bit of, 
of thoughts as far as how you work. And and rather than discard those, but rather than also take everyone's time in the webinar to read through them all, I'm just going to flash three slides really quickly that talk about your approach to modeling, things that you always keep in mind with when you model, and then also your approach to the purpose of using CAD and how that ties into uh, interacting with the goldsmith. And so the reason why we're flashing these up is so that when you go to watch the webinar on YouTube, you can take some time and pause and read these. But we've hopefully we've talked about most of these as, as Sasuke has modeled, but here they are just in text form as well. Let's move to part three now, which is a glimpse into Sasuke's current project with deadringers.ca. And Russ, are you on the line? I'm here, sir. Good. Russ, glad, glad yeah. to hear you. Thank you. So I wanted to introduce Russ Heinel, which is one of Saskia's current clients. And again, this is a, a neat experience for us to have you here because we've never had one of our customers' customers on here to talk about how T-Splines influences your life as, as a client. So Russ, if you could just take a minute to briefly introduce yourself and your profession, your background, and how you got into this jewelry business. Well, um, I think the, best, the first thing to say is I, I know nothing about the jewelry business. Uh, and as you know, Matt, I am an um, aerial and architectural photographer. And uh, in my previous life, uh, as I like to say, I was in the uh, rock and roll business. And um, <clears throat> I was recently looking at a picture of um, uh, Keith Richards from the Rolling Stones. And Keith uh, has been wearing this skull ring uh, since 1978. It's actually probably the most photographed ring in history. It's this very large skull ring. And I was looking at this picture of Keith, and he had his hand on, on his face, and you could very clearly see this big skull ring. And I was looking at it, and I thought to myself, boy, that looks really cool. And then I had a second thought, and I thought, oh, my goodness, wouldn't it be really cool if that skull was his skull? And it was kind of a um, uh, creepy thought, I suppose, but it crossed my mind. I thought, well, that's, that's very strange. but. Anyway, a couple of days later, I started pursuing um, skulls, and that took me down the road of a thing called forensic sculpting, which is what the police use when they have a skull of an un unknown person. And they use a technique uh, using um, the skull's features, and uh, they can tell what race it is from the skull, and using uh, tissue thicknesses, um, work basically flesh the skull out from the, the skull to what the face could look like, and that helps them find out who the person was. Um, that more recently became, instead of forensic sculpting, became digital forensic sculpting. So I started playing around with that, and then I turned it around and did it backwards called uh, re reverse digital forensic sculpting. And how that works is, um, we'll start with, say, uh, Keith Richards or Jimi Hendrix. Um, I would sample, um, say, uh, 100 different photographs of Jimi Hendrix's head. Um, and I'm looking for certain angles, um, particularly with uh, Jimi because he had a um, afro. It's hard because his hair was very thick uh, to find out the um, shape of his skull. Sure. And uh, so what happened is using reverse sculpting, I was able to build a skull into Jimi's head. And um, Somebody like Jimi Hendrix is what they call a uh, male African Negroid skull, and they have certain bone characteristics, mm -hmm. uh, uh, particularly with the eye sockets and, and nose, uh, nasal passage and uh, whatnot. So what, how it happened is I, I ended up building these skulls into their heads. Um, things like teeth were easier because we had pictures of all these people uh, uh, smiling. Um, oddly enough, Jim Morrison, who he also did, he didn't smile that much, but we were able to get some shots from smiling. And what that did is that allowed Saskia to actually sample the actual teeth and build those teeth into the models. So we ended up uh, building four different rock star skulls. And so we knew what their skulls looked like. We had their ears, their eyes, their nose, you know, everything about them, the shape of their forehead, the top of their head. So yeah, so, so basically what, what you did then is you created these like these front and then side 2D concepts really of what the school looked like, and that's what you gave Saskia. That's correct. Um, so once I had built these skulls, then the next question is, okay, what do I do with them? 
Uh, and um, as luck would have it, I, I didn't know exactly how to go about doing this. So I looked into the world of 3D printing, and of course that took me to Envision Tech. And um, it turns out that Bill Lutwin is the vice president of the Drury Division North America for en Envision Tech, and they're in uh, Deer Dearborn, Michigan. And so I phoned him, I actually got through to him on the phone, and I, I told him what the concept was, basically recreating the skulls of famous rock stars and turning into jewelry. And yeah. Bill's first the thing was, boy, that's really cool. Uh, and so he got involved with the uh, project because he liked it. And in working with Bill, uh, he turned me on to you, Matt, of course, and as the next logical step. And I, as, as, as we know, I contacted you, and you thought it was a great idea. Yep. And you got involved, and then from you it led to Saskia, and then we got Saskia involved, and she really wanted to, to work on these things. And so what happened is the digital skulls went over to Saskia, and she created these rings. Um, and I should say that she was, and this is very Im Im important to us, she was very... Um, What's, what's the best word? She was very aware of the structural reality of the skulls, because you can see it in their, their faces. Um, and so she took the structural reality, and then using her artistic abilities, as I say, our artistic license, uh, she was able to mold them into the rings that you're looking at now. Yeah. And it's funny, because you know I, I can look at these, these rings and the faces, and you know exactly who these people are, although there's no skin or hair or eyes there, you can tell who this person is. Yeah. Um, there's Jim Jim there. Um, and so it basically the digital uh, skulls were turned over to Saskia. She went to work on it, and this is what we ended up with. Yeah, no, those are those are stunning. So, so a, a question that had come in when Saskia was doing her other work was whether Saskia uses the 3D model just as a reference or if that's actually used to cast the actual hmm. ring. And Saskia, I wonder if you could you could speak to that. Sorry. Yeah, so so someone had asked a question about whether when you make a, a 3D model if that's just used as a as a reference or if that's actually used to 3D print and then cast the actual ring. That's the actual ring and that's the final model. Mhm. Mm that will be casted and that will be, let's say, either you make direct casting and you have one piece and that it's lost and that's the model, or you have like here, like production, you made a mold out of it and, and then get it produced. Yeah, and I guess from, from what you've told me, that's kind of one of your, uh, I don't know what to say, how to describe it, but that's extremely important to you that the render, how it seem, how it's appears in 3D as a render is the same shape yeah. that you'd get out of the cast. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, here it's it's nice to see the two pictures uh, beside each other, it's hardly in the same in the same view. It, that's really come out the same way as the cast came out. That yeah. what I done on the computer in the CID is it what the printing gets out. Mm -hmm. It should be like this. There should be no excuses if you put so many time on on CID and it's so precise, then the model should be precise. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, I, good. I would say, Matt, that that's, um, that's very true because in the uh, CAD file, what we saw and then what the final product looked like is, is literally identical. Yeah, and that was probably a unique experience for you coming really, being somewhat naive yeah. to, the, to the process to see how, how good that could really be. It, it was, it's just amazing um, because, you know, it was a seven-month seven month journey. Uh, uh, until we actually had uh, started making these things, and um, they look exactly like the uh, renderings. Um, uh, things like that really I find fascinating is um, the uh, Janus ring, which is Janus Joplin. The characteristics there you can see in in her her, her teeth. Um, if you look at pictures of Janus smiling, her teeth are fairly short, whereas Jim Morrison has very large teeth. Um, and you look at the uh, Janus ring, and it looks feminine. It's just not ugly mm -hmm. at all. It's a beautiful, feminine look to it. And, you know, I, I can look at any one of these rings, and one of the places I, I go first besides the eye socket, which to me tells a lot, is the teeth 
and the uh, nose. And Janice had a bit of a, um, I wouldn't say hook nose, but if you look at her profiles, that nose is very, it's a bit different than the other three rings. And yep. you can look at any one of these rings, and you can see the profile of her bone structure showing through on the faces of them. Yeah, yeah, really impressive. So, so to learn to learn more about this, then you can go to your website deadringers.ca and and mm -hmm. learn more. Right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Well, good. Well, I, Russ, I really appreciate you coming on. It's just a treat to have have again our customers customer on to to see what T spines mean to you. And and really, you don't really care about the technology. All you care about is that your concept is realized <laughs> in the way that I think the best thing to say is it works. Yep. It works. I mean, we have rings here that are exactly what I was hoping for. Yep. Well, good. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. Okay. Well, we just got a couple minutes left, so I wanted to open it up for general questions and answers, either about this project or Saskia's work or T-Spines in general. And thank everyone for coming. So let me just see which questions we have that have come in. Okay, so Saskia, a number of, a number of people have asked what program you use to render in. It's uh, KeyShot, Render, HDR Light Studio mm -hmm. for the background. Yeah. Okay. It so comes question, out very realistic and yeah, you can shoot it does. very it's a, quick. It's a good yeah. program. So a question which is maybe directed to both uh, Russ and Saski is how long did the school take, I guess, for Russ for you to get the 2D concept and then Saskia for you to get the T-spine model? <laughs> oh. uh, well, I've been involved for just before Christmas, so it's been like seven months, but I, I took a lot of uh, wrong turns along the way to actually learn where I had to be. And with, with me, the, the break, uh, besides the concept of doing Rockstar Skulls, came with Envision en Tech. And when that happened, then the doors started opening up. So I think that was probably about three and a half months into it. And after that, once we got Sasky involved, yeah. then it started to make sense to me. Yeah, and Saskia, how how long does it take you to model something like this? Are you are you there, Saskia? Yeah, we might have lost her. Maybe she doesn't want to answer that question. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, I mean, I can't say if it was long or short, Matt, because I, I don't really know the industry. Yep. Um, but she. Hello, you hear me? Oh, there you are. I'm sorry. I, I was out. I don't know. <laughs> I heard you, but you don't hear me. Yep. How long I took for the for the model? Yeah. That's that's a question we had before. <laughs> you can't say a time, but really, I I I worked on this day and night. I I think at least for the first basic skull with the teeth, I don't know, two weeks, but really I, I went to sleep two at the night. I mean, because, I mean, really, I not finish it. yeah, I mean, my impression is your work, Saskia, we saw you get that fish, the basic shape, really quickly, but then you're spending all this time just iterating and tweaking, really, like an artist, just getting it right. Yeah, yes, but that's, that's fun. You need to have a little bit patience for your work. To, to, to let it grow <laughs> yep. yeah and to decide and then to say okay now it's finished mm -hmm. but not to say ah, I put here a little bit there a little bit and chuck it's it's ready it's you need to put a little bit more love inside I would say <laughs> yeah yeah patient yeah so there's another question is there a tutorial on how to start sculpting a skull did or did, did you follow a tutorial Saskia or did you just kind of put together did you follow one of the three workflows that you were describing to us I I I think I followed the the I really I don't remember but I think I started with the quad ball of the head mhm mm and and I modeled the the way I I model and as well I put let's say for the eyes I put another quad ball and I did the same but in the inside like I did with the fish on the outside Mm -hmm. So you just kind of, For the combined, of, the, of the, yeah. combined, I combined those different approaches. Yeah. The the teeth I made with the TS pipe, even if it sounds funny, but it's a TS pipe. Every teeth every teeth is one pipe command. Interesting. Yeah. So you had there's a name that you've printed on here. So like Keith or on the other page, like the different names. How did you do that? What command did you use? 
Oh, that's the pipe command. As I showed with your T splines before, I just use my handwriting to, to, to sign the rings, the name they, they belong to. And then I made the TS pipe command. And here I put the splop command at the end to fit the writing exactly on the position it should be on the surface of the okay. cell. And then you just boolean. It works very well. And then you just boolean that in at the end. Yeah, at the end. But then if it's if it's pulled, then it's finished. You can't change anything anymore. Yep. Okay. So when you when you made the score, how did you map out the needed T spline surfaces? So because the the topology here, how everything is connected, it's it's somewhat complex. Was that did you get that right the first time, or did it require some experimentation to see how everything should hook together? I think that the, I got it on the first time, but I played around a lot. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. That must be the, the, the most problem was to 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 put the skull into a shape of the ring that the ring should fit on a finger. Perfect. That it's not the teeth are not standing up. That it's it's really comfortable to wear. That was my intention. That what I said before in the beginning. If you put the skull beside, it looks nice, and if you wear it on the finger, it's it's that it should belongs there. Yeah. It should be in, yeah. Yeah, those are some complex requirements because it does look nice here, but it needs to also look nice when it's sitting on your on your finger, doesn't it? Yeah, and it should be comfortable because really, usually the 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 front face, the teeth, will come up. So it's it's not exactly a skull skull because I made a little bit dentistic uh, work. Yep. Because if you look on the left side on the real skull, it's like a, an oval, mm -hmm. but it will not fit an oval to a to a round ring. Yep. So I. Yep. Yeah, makes sense. So just talking about your work in general, Saskia, how do you approach Pave settings on a T-spline object? How do I approach Pave setting on T-splines? That's patient. That's patient because you need a you need. To make Pavi setting, you need to say, now the model is finished, and I want to have these parts set in Pavi, mm -hmm. because then you need a surface. And there I use the, the Rhino Jewel okay. command. But yes, it's just patient. It's like a puzzle, because you need really to fit all the parts together that it looks nicely. That's just work. And, and it's proportions of the stones, and I entitled the size of the stone should be not too big and not too small. It's just uh, you get used to it during working in, in long time experience so to do you, use the right stones. So do you, do you convert to NURBS before you do the pave? Yes. Okay, that would make sense. So here's a question. But I try to use one, one, one really closed surface that mm. it's not cut in the middle. Oh, that makes sense. So here's a question, were all the four skull rings modeled off of the same base T-spine model and tweaked, or did you model each of them from scratch? Um, I had really a base, a basic model then. I started with the Keith. Okay. And I, I took out Jimi Hendrix, but I, I really modeled them hardly completely new because they look really different. It's an, it's an a, um, African style. So by working, you figure out that he has totally different position of the forehead yeah. and the eyes. So, but I use this base shape from Keith Richards to model the other ones. Out. Yeah, because because the underlying topology is the same. I mean, everyone has eyes and a nose and a mouth, but really, where the work is is tweaking it, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't have that now. Sorry. Oh so, well, just with. So the topology, I mean, the basic layout of the face, is, they're, they're all similar. Like everyone has two eyes and a nose and, yeah, and yeah, a yeah. jaw, but the positions of everything is, is different. Yes, they are different. And uh, if you work so long with, the, let's say, with the Janice Joplin, you figure out that she's really a female and she's different from Keith Richards. It's, yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it's, yeah, you really, yeah, yeah that's impressive. So were the teeth bullioned in later, or was that all part of the yes. same T-spline? Yes, these are T-splines, but I pulled everything together at the end. The writing, yeah. and there's inside there's a logo for Dead, uh, dead Ringers, uh -huh. CA, and 
the teeth, everything later on. Yep. Put yeah. Put together that, to it. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense because I think doing everything as a single T spine, if it if it's supposed to by nature flow well, that makes sense. But the teeth are separate objects, indeed, aren't they? So yeah. bullying bullying those makes a lot of sense. Yes, I think that w that would not work. I, you could do it, I think, but no. Yep. That way, I I put it in two parts. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, good. Well, Saskia, thank you so much for taking time to do this webinar with us today. You're welcome. I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, no, this this went well, and I, I, I appreciate your, you've always been really generous to our community, and this is just an example of that. So thank you very much. And Russ, thanks for jumping on the line. Well, thank you for having me here. Okay. So good. So this webinar will be posted on YouTube so you can watch it later. And then as you exit the webinar, we'll just pop up a brief survey. If you could answer that, that just helps us make sure that future webinars are more are relevant and, and helpful to, to the community. So again, thanks everyone for joining and have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.